Right. Good, good morning and uh, good evening, everyone. A spe special uh, word of welcome to our colleagues in Australia who are you know, coming together for a very early start at 6 a.m. in the morning. A little bit earlier, uh, later here in New Zealand, but then on the other side of the spectrum, uh, Grania, who is after nine o'clock in the evening, uh, in a condition of jet lag, we, we, we're calculating that uh, Grania's body feels it's 4 a.m. in the morning. But um, so just a, a special welcome to everyone uh, joining at you know this, these these times. Uh, let me just start the screen share here. And if we're lucky, this is not going to crash. Is that coming through for you? Yeah, yes. got that. Yep. Fantastic. Let me just scroll this. Yep, down. fine. There's the agenda. Right. So, again, welcome. Uh, just note at the, at the onset, I've received a written from Erwin de Vries at Thompson Rivers University, uh, Nicholas Todd uh, from USQ and Sarah Lambert from University of Wollongong, uh, who wanted to be here. And they sent their written apologies, so another reason why we're here, so they can just catch up at a, at a later time. So what, what we'll do is we'll go through a round of introductions, but I thought just by kicking off, uh, just highlighting that, uh, and I, I posted this to the list today, uh, this learning in a digital age course development is a first for the OERU in, in a number of respects. Um, I mean, oh, clearly, I mean, this is a course that is going to benefit every learner who is wanting to engage in tertiary study. But it's the first OERU course where the curriculum outline is being developed through an open consultation process uh, before actually finalizing the it's the first OERU development that we've actually derived from a number of existing courses that are currently offered uh, or, or, or programs that have been approved at an, a number of our partners. Um, it is the first OERU course that we've actually uh, used a bit of crowdsourcing and this was a, an idea that uh, Bronya suggested uh, and it's, you know, we've, we've had some good feedback there. Uh, it is the first course that we will be offering micro-credentials, uh, digital badges that will be mapped to formal academic credit at Chicago Polytechnic. Um, and I, I, I'm optimistic that this is going to be a very successful open boundary course, that more than one partner will be reusing the course materials for teaching to local Hupi students in their own learning management system learning in parallel with our OERU learners. So a number of firsts there, and for, for that reason, we are keen to develop a case study uh, on this development, and which is why we have our marketing and communications consultant uh, joining us. We will introduce himself in a moment. We've received a little bit of funding from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation for capacity development in uh, marketing communications and fund development, and uh, that's, uh, we're hoping to develop a case study that form part of that project as well. So it's it's looking quite exciting. So at this stage, I'd, I'd like to go around the table for, for introductions. Uh, so in order of the folk that appear on my screen, uh, let me hand over first uh, to, Gra to Grania, who I'm sure with many doesn't really need introduction. I mean, Grania is a leading thinker in e-learning, but we, we will also hold her to task uh, with a partner in crime, uh, Ulf Dan Ehlers, for introducing us to you know, open education practices. And we're trying to live up to you know, the standards you've set for us. So Grania, welcome on board. It's really, really pleased to have you the consultant <coughs> project. Thanks, Wayne. I'm Absolutely delighted to be involved with the project. I think it's very, very exciting for the reasons uh, you outlined. Uh, as you mentioned, Ulf and I were involved in a project called OPAL, the OPAL Initiative, which originally defined the notion of open educational practices about the idea that we need to go beyond simply the creation of OER to looking and understanding how we create, manage, reuse, repurpose um, OER. And we came up with a number of dimensions and a set of criteria for how institutions could benchmark their OER practices and um, develop them and take a, a vision forward. 
Um, I'm now, as Wayne said, an independent e-learning consultant and uh, loving it so far. Uh, I was at Bar Spa University previously, before that, um, at Leicester, before that, the OU, uh, Southampton, Bristol. So I've moved around um, quite a few different uh, places. I've been involved in lots of uh, research projects in this area, uh, particularly through the JISC in the UK, um, uh, the EU, uh, ESRC, etc. So I've done lots of work on uh, OER projects. Opal, I mentioned, uh, there was also a project called Power Up, which looked at um, policy initiatives um, around the world. We developed a series of um, uh, case studies of OER initiatives in different countries. Um, and also I've been involved in a lot of MOOC developments. Uh, it's probably also worth mentioning relevance um, to the course. Uh, I was recently involved in a project called Open Cred, which was funded or commissioned by IPTS, uh, who are an EU uh, research centre based in Seville, where we looked at the um, recognition, as we called it, of informal and non-formal learning, particularly for OERs and MOOCs. And so hopefully some of that will feed into our background thinking. Um, that's probably enough for me. I'll just put a link into the chat to my um, uh, uh, website. So if anybody wants to know more about my background and area of interest, they can have a look at that. Thanks, Grania. I have, to, I have to say your timing in moving to, into the world of consulting was perfect. <laughs> and we were able to get, get you, you know, in the early phases of this initiative, just getting started with leaders. So we're very excited. Uh, moving on then in the order on my screen, uh, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michelle Harrison. I'm a senior instructional designer at Thompson Rivers University. So I work with uh, Erwin. Um, on his team. Um, our interest uh, generally, or I have a personal interest in more of the open boundary courses. Um, I worked, uh, did some my thesis work on looking at um, sort of how learners engage with open boundary spaces. And we are also interested in, um, we're developing a few courses in a master's program and looking at open educational practices. Um, we had thought we would do a whole stream, but may not happen so right now we're looking at a couple courses um so hopefully we can contribute some um curriculum and some ideas as well as get some ideas from this project for that uh, yes michelle absolutely and and the other very powerful connection of course is that uh this uh, this course leader will be part of the <coughs> new uh first year of study and the one of the exit credentials that we are targeting is of course this studies at Thompson Rivers University, so I mean, this course uh, could carry credit transfer into uh, your exit credential. So there's a very important linkage sort of on the formal credentialing piece aside as well. So welcome, it's great to have you on board. Um, uh, next on my screen, uh, Mooka getting back to New Zealand, uh, Ray. Kia ora, good morning everybody. Uh, this is my first OER you meeting, so um, I've, we've just had a little bit of a, a shuffle round of responsibilities at Otago Polytech and, and OP Online specifically, and I'm just coming on board, so I'm going to be a bit of a loiterer for this meeting a little bit, I think, and uh, suck up all the information and all the knowledge that uh, everyone's bringing from around the world. Very excited to be Absolutely. part of it and looking forward to it. Absolutely, and uh, Ray, we, we're really quite excited to have you as, you know, as, as part of the OER, OERU team at, um, you know, at the Poly, so the numbers are growing and it's great. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, next in line there, uh, my partner in crime and one of the thought leaders uh, in the OERU, Emeritus Professor Jim Taylor. Uh, morning, everyone. And um, I was, uh, I'm retired now, so I must be crazy to be getting up at this hour to join in. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm sort of semi-retired. I worked at the University of Southern Queensland for many years where I was latterly the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Global Learning Services and Chief Information Officer. And I still retain an office at the University of Work on a number of projects and have worked with Wayne on the OERU since the onset of the project. Um, I also 
worked, um, I heard Gronya mention the JRCIPTS. I worked with them on the Open Education Project uh, a few years ago in Seville. And I retain an interest in, in all of this. I'd, I'd like to see it become operational. And uh, my other hat that I wear at the moment is as a board member of the OER Foundation. Um, so I'm very interested in the area. It's my background for many, many years, and I'm happy to see um, open education progressing at a high rate of knots. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. And uh, as, as always, we are very grateful for your generous uh, gift of time uh, in helping move the OERU forward. And you know, there aren't many sort of course developments that. <coughs> Uh, attest to the fact of having two board members as part of the design team. So uh, that's an indication of the significance and importance that the, you know, the OERU is placing on this development. So thanks very much, Jim. Uh, moving on then, next in line, to, uh, Stephen Phillips, going back to the U.S. now. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Phillips. Uh, I am the assistant director of the Center for the Assessment of Learning here at Thomas Edison. Can you guys hear me all okay? Yeah, loud and clear, Stephen. Great. I was having some yeah. trouble, trouble with my audio earlier, but I'm glad to see that's resolved. Um, so I guess the, the expertise that I'm bringing to this particular project is I'm working on developing uh, what we're calling a PLA 300 here at uh, Thomas Edison, which is essentially a, uh, a course that's designed to teach students what OER is all about and how they can use it. Um, how they can design their own study guide um, and their own self-assessment plan to uh, learn the requisite uh, knowledge that they need to pass a prior learning assessment. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, um, it is obviously clear to everyone that, that is here, um, the PLA 300 course from Thompson Rivers, uh, not, uh, Thomas Edison State University is, is one of the key courses we use to help assemble the curriculum outline because we're trying to maximize uh, reuse potential of, of, of leader across the network so uh, Stephen uh, thank you kindly for you know sharing your curriculum outline openly uh, it was you know it was a great help in getting us to this point absolutely but moving on then uh, let me uh, just cross go across to the Pacific uh, Victoria I believe uh, to Jason Finity Hi everyone. I'm uh, Jason Finnerty. I'm uh, a marketing consultant, uh, hoping to spread the word about OERU and and all things OER. Um, I'm here to listen and learn, and I'll try to be as quiet as possible. Great, and Jason, uh, thank you for you know taking the time out and and to meet the folk. Uh, we really appreciate it. And you know, as we've discussed, uh, we think this would make a very powerful case study. Uh, for the reasons we uh, mentioned earlier on uh, uh, I, there will be at least you know five countries uh, engaged in you know, teaching this course uh, at least and so that's quite special and you know, just goes to show the international reach of our collaboration it's it's very exciting and i'm i'm definitely looking forward to uh, getting some more information as to how everything kind of came about and uh, um I, I, I think there's going to be a fantastic story here, so I'm looking forward to it. And I apologize, I have lights on all over the place. I'm not too sure why it looks like I'm in a cavern at midnight. So <laughs> it's, it's just how it is <laughs> around Vancouver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on then, uh, uh, Travis. Oh, yes, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm from the University of Wollongong in Australia. It's just south of Sydney. Um, my role, I'm new to both my role and OAR, so I'm going to try and just listen in today. Um, one of my colleagues, Sarah Lambert, is also involved, um, and she runs our um, Open University Initiative. Uh, my role is running uh, what we call Critical Digital Literacies, which is funded from student services fees and legislatively that means I can't be involved in anything to do with actual credit. So this is going to be an interesting process, how I negotiate, uh, how I negotiate that because it has to be additional uh, work. So I'm interested just to, just to listen today, work out how I can fit my program and my contributions into, into everyone else's work and progress. 
Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Travis. And uh, I mean, you, you would be aware of this. I mean, this is the power of open. Uh, there's nothing that would restrict you from reusing any outputs uh, that, that, that we developed for your, your own programs in any way, um, even if they don't carry credit. So again, you know, it's the power of the open model. We, you know, we can reuse and remix for, for multiple purposes. And hey, maybe in time, uh, Wollongong will want to join the credentialing part as well. Yes, I, I think it's certainly a possibility. Um, and certainly I think I can contribute some, some material that we're developing. We have a lot of open educational resources that currently are not open. They're locked in a, a, an LMS. So I'm looking to change that very soon. Oh, we'll be able to help you there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Moving on then. Can, uh, can I just mention it? Sure. Carry on. I was just going to say, um, it may, yeah, I was just going to say it may or may not be relevant um, to what you were saying, Travis, but um, Wollongong is well known for its work on learning design through work of uh, Sue Bennett, um, Shirley um, Agostini and others. Um, and so that may well also um, fit into this um, development in some ways. Physically, I'm located next to that team. Uh, literally in this, literally in the same office. Oh, okay. um, Organisation quite different, but yeah, we sit. I sit next to them all. Cool. Okay. Uh, so they're moving on. Then next in line on my screen is David uh, Bull. And uh, David, again, I I apologise for getting you up at this hour. That's fine. Um, that's fine, Wayne. I'm not used to getting up at this hour, but. Um, I'm up, somehow, with, with a coffee in hand, I might add. Um, my name's David Bull. Um, as Wayne has said, I'm with the University of Southern Queensland. Um, particularly, I, I, I'm very involved uh, or uh, very committed to OERU and, the, and getting the MVP rolling. Um, but I'm particularly interested in this particular uh, project of designing leader uh, because some years ago we um, we became very conscious of the importance of digital literacy for uh, students who were commencing tertiary studies and um, put together a course of our own called eLiteracy. Um, we've been running that as an online course for some time now, for a few years, and it's been very uh, effective and very important at part of, of the particular program that it operates in. And um, so I'm hoping that this will be a, a two-way um, kind of contribution. I'm hoping we'll be able to contribute our thoughts to um, the new leader project. Uh, but I'm also hoping that we'll be able to learn from this design exercise and feedback into um, our existing um, offering of our only literacy course. Yeah. So that's probably about all I can raise at 6 a.m. in the morning here. F fair enough, uh, David, and again, thank you for getting up so early. Um, as you know, the uh, USQ's e-literacy for contemporary society, which I believe is the, the, the course you're referring to, uh, has formed part of you know, the development of the curriculum outline, again, you know, to uh, try and maximize reuse potential. So um, this is quite exciting. Let me move along here. And uh, last but not least, and not too early in the morning, uh, my, my partner in crime in Christchurch, uh, Dave Lane, who is at the Christchurch office. Let me hand over to you, Dave. Good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone. Um, yeah, apologies for my flaky arrival. My, uh, my testing of the Zoom product over the last few weeks has resulted in a very unstable system, which has been crashing, as you've probably seen me coming and going over the last few minutes. So apologies for that. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm here mostly to actually listen to what you're all talking about as well, because my background is in technology more than in education. And uh, so I'm looking at uh, ways that I can help create techno technological uh, solutions and innovations that will make your work easier in building this in building these course and uh, other courses as well. So I'm very happy to be part of your team. Yes, uh, thanks, thanks very much. And um, as Dave mentioned, we, we are both um, active users of uh, free and open source software. Uh, it's, you know, it's a core uh, philosophy of our company. Um, nobody at the OER uh, Foundation is actually permitted, in inverted commas, to use non-free software. 
but I doubt that any staff member working at the foundation would want to. So, um, it, it's an important part of the puzzle because um, of the, obviously the delivery of these courses uh, outside of the learning management system is based entirely on a free and open source software stack. So Dave, we're glad to have you, uh, you know, helping us out. And what you forgot to mention, you are also president of the New Zealand Open Source Software Society, which is as well. Yeah, and you, you would hope that I would be the, the one who could get all this software run properly. So, yes, I apologize if it doesn't build confidence that I can't seem to even join the conference. Uh, we, we gain to, we'll blame the proprietary vendor. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's where I'm leaning. <laughs> right. So, moving on then um, with the agenda, just a little bit of background as to you know, where this leader course uh, has come from. Uh, at our most recent uh, meeting of the OERU Management Committee, where we approved the confirmed courses for the first year of study, there was a strong recommendation that the, this Learning in a Digital Age course should form part of the OERU first year. And at that stage, we didn't have any partners who'd actually confirmed uh, that they would offer assessment services towards academic credit, because obviously that's a critical piece in the puzzle. I mean, every course that forms part of the OERU minimum viable product in our first year of study must be available for credit at at least one partner. Um, but uh, I was very pleased with uh, discussions in, internally here at Otago Polytechnic. Uh, we were able to confirm that Otago Polytechnic will offer assessment services for transcript credit as part of an, uh, a very interesting qualification, which is called the Graduate Diploma in Tertiary Education. Um, for those of you that are from North America, don't be confused by the label of Graduate Diploma. It's not a postgraduate course. It's a very interesting uh, professional qualification designed for vocational educators uh, moving into tertiary education. And it has courses at both third year level as well as first year level. So it's quite unique in that. <coughs> so that potentially also uh, widens up opportunities for a sort of parallel mode presentation of the course at both first year assessment at first year level and also third year level, uh, which, which is an, an, an interesting opportunity where we might look at you know, different and more uh, co complex and advanced assessments for a higher level of learning. Uh, but that's not on the table yet, but it is certainly a possibility we could explore down the track. Um, also, uh, in terms of the background, we've, we've referred to this already. The initial drafting of this curriculum outline was based on two courses that are currently offered at OERU Partners. The first one, Stephen has already been talking about, the PLA 300, from, and this is a, a typo here. It's uh, Tom... Uh, um, Thomas Edison State University. I'll f fix that up in a moment. I apologize for that, Stephen. Um, and the second course, of course, the uh, e-literacy for contemporary society uh, that is offered at the University of S Southern Queensland uh, for credit. Sorry, Wayne, just interrupt you for a second. Uh, the PLA 300 course actually isn't currently being offered. It's still in development here at Thomas Edison. Correct, yeah, uh, but your, your curriculum is approved for mapping to PLA 300. Is, is yes, that's correct. correct. Yeah, okay. Um, we also then, uh, this is a suggestion that uh, Gronja had uh, made that we, why, I mean, what, given that we have this open collaboration, why don't we, you know, crowdsource ideas for, you know, topics for inclusion? So what I basically did is I took those two course outlines and uh, it, put together a Kanban board uh, with all the, the topics and we opened this up for uh, contributions from folk around the world and uh, we did get some you know some good feedback about 30 uh, you know ideas and topics that were suggested there uh, that have been incorporated uh, into the draft outline that we've got so far and I mean it is interesting that this particular page has already you know generated you know well over a thousand page views so, so people are, are taking a look at what we're doing. Uh, there's clearly a genuine interest, and um, that's where we are uh, today. So what I thought uh, we would do uh, now is to actually have a look at uh, some of the early feedback we have from the curriculum outline that we put together on this Kanban board. 
So basically what I did was I, you know, I took all the topics and uh, learning challenges from the PLA 300 course and USQ's uh, course, and I mapped them on this board. Uh, what I also did is I took all the topics that were suggested uh, through the crowdsourcing exercise and also mapped them on this board. And there's a bit of a color coding going on here, uh, which may not be that apparent at first look. But how this basically works is any, any card that has one of these um, black marker boxes there is an item that came from the, you know, the crowdsourcing list. Uh, so this, we know where that's coming from. Any of the items which has a yellow block um, is an item or a learning pathway that was part of the USQ course. Uh, the second uh, label, label that I'm using here was the high level classification that uh, USQ was using within their course just you know, to help with navigating some of this stuff. Uh, the other label which I used was this orange label which might not be coming through that clearly on your screen, um, which is uh, uh, course materials which the OER Foundation has already completed. I mean, we have quite a num uh, number of course resources available in the wiki format around copyright, around Creative Commons licensing, which could uh, potentially be reused. And one of the uh, advantages of that uh, coding system with the the, the color flags is that we can start doing a bit of filtering because this helped me in deciding you know how to divide up um, this draft curriculum outline into uh, the different micro courses so for example if you apply the filter for uh, Thomas Edison State uh, University uh, in theory what should happen uh, let me take this away just the cards let me just take that away. Yeah, just the cards that are left um, from the curriculum of Thomas Edison State University are on the board. So, it, you know, it, you, you can see clearly now that uh, our current outline for microcourse one, microcourse two, and microcourse five would fit the curriculum proposal at, uh, at, at Thomas Edison State University. And this also started thinking about, well, you know, we could actually build this course in a way that um, for Thomas Edison State University, learners might do micro one, micro two, <coughs> micro five for the three um, credits at, at your institution. Whereas in our part of the world, um, it might be more appropriate to do micros one, two, three, and four. Uh, because the components in micro five is, is quite specific to what you were aiming to achieve at uh, Thomas Edison State University, uh, Stephen. The other uh, issue, of course, is here in our part of the world, uh, the, the learners would be required to complete four micro courses. Each micro course is roughly about 40 notional hours of learning compared to three micro courses in North America to make up the three credits. So it's another aspect we've had to think about uh, in designing and putting this board together. Uh, but what I want to refer to before we get into the detail of uh, the actual cards on the Kanban board is just to acknowledge uh, the feedback that uh, you have been providing uh, on the initial drafts. Uh, moving down here, just excuse me for a moment, there's a heater that's come on that might be a bit noisy. I'm just gonna switch it off. You know, we live in the cold south. <coughs> hope I got rid of the white noise there. Um, so what I want to do is just uh, acknowledge and note the feedback that we've had. Uh, we posted uh, links to the early drafts of that Kanban board. Uh, we uh, received feedback from, from Jim uh, referring to, um, we had links to the, the leader research project and, and Jim just reiterated that uh, much of that research work was done with the focus on, on educators uh, or, and you know, training and development of professional development for you know, educators and tertiary, educator, tertiary education, which is not our primary audience. 
our primary audience are learners embarking on tertiary study. Uh, and so it was just an emphasis of the target audience there. Uh, of course, that's good feedback. Uh, we've integrated that. Uh, we had good feedback from from Steve. I, actually, speaking to uh, Jim, I, I apologize. I should have actually asked you to speak to that point, but I'll ask you to speak to the next one. Um, Steve, uh, if I might just hand over to you if you just want to comment on the, the feedback that, that you had posted. Steve, are, are you still with us? Let me just do a quick check here. Maybe the audio problem. Yes. Sorry, oh. I, was, uh, I was on mute and I was talking to myself. <laughs> Happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I guess the, there was a couple points of feedback that I had. Um, I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that we've done with PLA uh, is kind of all of the, the introducing what is open education and what are open resources and how they work. Um, we're all lumped together in the same, mo in the same mod we call them modules, I guess they're units for you guys. Um, and I think that that's maybe more of a, a coherent uh, experience for students to learn all of these pieces together. Um, and so that was, that was the first uh, point that I made. The second one, um, in our module three uh, of PLA 300, we're looking at, um, now that you know what OER is and you know uh, how to find it, how do you know what's a good resource? You know, how do you, critically examine uh, what a <clears throat> what a good resource is you know what a, what is what is bias what are fa logical fallacies how do you identify them um, you know how do you read against the grain I guess is one way to, to, to phrase it um, and so I suggested that you know maybe we uh, put that together in, mi in micro three I think initially it was in in micro number five um, and kind of like front loading that a little bit more so students are, are encountering that that information uh, earlier on um, and then the final point of, of feedback that I had was um, the idea of you know what is learning and how has it changed over time that's <clears throat> that's a very large question and honestly you could base a whole separate course around that um, and I don't know like students need to have some understanding of the process of learning in order to do a self-directed pathway but kind of going into the historical context of learning and the evolution of the, the higher education system might be maybe, maybe a, a bridge too far. Yeah. And, and, and Steve, uh, Steve, all good, good points. Um, I mean, I, I think the point about sequencing is very important. Uh, I mean, you clearly, you can't speak, you know, start thinking about OER unless you actually know how copyright works because if you don't know how copyright works, you can't understand Creative Commons licensing, so we're going to have to think very carefully about the sequencing uh, within uh, micro courses. So, I mean, that point was well made, and, uh, and the focus and work that you guys were doing in PLAP, around uh, uh, fallacies, uh, etc., I, I think are very relevant uh, to components of this course. So, I do appreciate that feedback, and I've done my best to work it into the Kanban board. We'll have a look now. Where you can judge if that is has been the case. Um, moving on, we also had uh, good feedback uh, from Jim, and, and, and this was invaluable, Jim, uh, in helping me get my head around what would be, you know, sort of a good sequence. So, if I could perhaps hand the mic over to you and mic a little bit to your thinking there. Uh, thanks, Wayne. Um, just uh, briefly before I comment on this, uh, I think the, the leader framework that was introduced in part one is still very relevant. I made a big focusing on, you know, relatively new learners to the, the space. Uh, I think the framework that has the overview there that I put the link to has digital practices that I focus on what competent digital learners uh, uh, digitally enable it. So that's the final column. So I still think that's a useful starting point, even though I made the view that we weren't necessarily focusing on uh, 
professional development of academic teachers and so on. And I then spend a bit of time looking at the overview of putting PLA 300 together with the USQ course and suggested a simpler set of uh, working titles and a change in the sequence, uh, which is now embedded in the, in the board. Uh, Wayne made those changes, and uh, I think it, we should work from the, the top down, as it were, when we discuss this, because it's easy to get um, bogged down in, in detail of particular cards. And my main suggestion, apart from the change in sequence, was to try and get the learners started on actually developing skill using digital practices, um, just to get them engaged, to keep the motivation up, make sure they've got access, nothing too complex, nothing too academic, a bit of online socialization, if we can, in that early phase. And that's why I think that micro one uh, should be you know, open and then the rest is open for discussion thanks yeah. Th thanks thanks for that jim and and, and yes um, you would have seen from my response i mean i thought those were all excellent recommendations and were a great help in uh, restructuring the board and you'll see now that this version of the board actually reflects the the suggested micro courses that jim had put together and i shuffled quite a number of these cards uh, you know or changed the order uh, to, you know to fit in with those micro structures so we'll get to that in a moment what i just also wanted to quickly reference uh, many of you will be familiar with this but uh was the just uh, seven uh let me just scroll down here the seven elements of digital literacy i mean this is really what we uh, are aiming uh, to achieve for our learners, you know, just this kind of recognition that digital literacy is more than, uh, you know, using your mobile phone and posting on Facebook. Uh, the, you know, there's other components to digital literacy, and this is sort of the high-level framework uh, that is sort of guiding the, the, the classification, if you will, of the different uh, literacies that we uh, are covering in, 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 in the program or intending to cover. We may decide that, you know, uh, that's not appropriate, but that was kind of the starting point that I was looking at uh, in, in guiding my thinking uh, around this process because, you know, there is a research base for this work. Um, Ronnie, I don't know if you wanted to add uh, any comments at this stage in terms of sort of these sort of high level uh, literacies. I'm also talking to myself. Um, I think the basing it around the JISC um, work is a really good thing to do. That's been very thoroughly done and uh, built particularly on the work of Helen Beetham, who's very well known in the field. Um, I think it gives a really good articulation of the kind of diversity of what digital literacies are about, uh, way beyond just simple ICT skills. Uh, so I think it's a good overarching framework. I really like Jim's reordering uh, and in particular getting the participants straight into uh, practical engagement in the course. I think that will make it much more meaningful. Um, so I, I really like the kind of reordering. I think it's really good. I wonder also whether somehow we could, uh, we want to consider incorporating the work of um, Henry Jenkins on digital literacy. If, if you, you'll be aware that he developed a, he and colleagues developed a framework, I think it's 12. <coughs> literacy which include things like um, judgments and relates to the points made earlier on so how do you know whether a resource is relevant for your learning at a particular time yeah uh, Gronia, that, that that's a good point um, what what we'll do is we'll add this add uh, you know a link to Henry Jenkins work as you know part of the resources and uh, it will be a good framework in you know uh, to to actually evaluate, to see you know, the extent that we are actually covering these things, how we might actually integrate it into the teaching and learning experience. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Okay, at, at this point, before we actually move it, into... It the, might be quite... Carry on, Grania. Sorry, I was just going to say, it might be quite nice to see, maybe this is something I can have a go at, uh, as to whether we can map Jenkins... Um, 
uh, work to the JISC framework. I don't know whether that's possible or not, but um, maybe I'll have a go at that. Yeah, good, uh, good idea, Gronia. I, I, I mean, I think that's a valuable exercise. Um, to make sure that we, you know, that this in, in is also a bit of research-led teaching. That you know, we, it, you know, it is coming from the research evidence uh, around these things, uh, which is you know a justification and for making a, a more robust course. Yep. So, so at this point, before we actually move into the detail of the actual curriculum outline, are, are there any uh, comments from the floor uh, that you would like to add at this point? Um, our practice at OERU meetings is silence means assent. Uh, so um, if, if you do have something you'd like to contribute at this stage, now's a good time to make that contribution. It's Michelle. Um, I was wondering about, um, um, I might be missing it, if there's something about network learning in here for student care, and maybe it would fit in micro five. Uh, good question, Michelle. So um, I, I think there are aspects of network learning uh, incorporated in here. One of the key features of any OERU course is how we actually teach. Uh, so we, we use connect, I'm not, we're not choosing any particular paradigmatic point of departure here, but actually use the connectivist learning tools uh, for learners uh, using a, a kind of a distributed a learning experience. Our interactions are distributed across the network. So the actual learning experience is very much a network learning experience because there we are you model, model where we don't provide tutorial support. So that answer, uh, that one component, uh, of, of your question, but it would be extremely valuable as we work through the detail of each of these micro courses to have use that filter, Michelle, uh, you know, of network learning and the extent that, uh, you know, we are covering it adequately. So thanks for that. Any other points at this stage? Taking silence to mean assent, going, going, gone. Okay, moving on then. Uh, let's start having a look at uh, some of the detail of the curriculum outline. I think the first point we need to address is, um, are, are we comfortable with the five course, uh, micro course division, uh, you know, based on the work we've done so far? Um, so let me just open up the floor to that question. Of course, we will, you know, given that this is a Kanban board, at any point if we find that uh, one card is better suited to another learning pathway in terms of its sequencing, it's, it's very easy to uh, move these around. So at this stage, I'm not worrying about the detail of the individual cards in each micro course, but the question is, uh, are you comfortable with the high-level division that we are proposing uh, for these micro courses. So in the Australian and New Zealand part of the world, learners would typically do uh, the fir these first four micro courses. And as I indicated uh, elsewhere, Thomas Edison State University, your cards are covered in micro five, uh, micro one, and what uh, I don't recall what the other one was. Uh, we can quickly have a look. Um, yeah, micro one, micro two, and micro five. So let me open up the floor there. Uh, are we comfortable with a high level division? I just wonder whether we should, um, can you hear me okay? I just wonder whether we should have media literacy before open education, um, because open education is, is quite a complex term. Uh, and going back to what Jim was saying earlier, I wonder whether going through the media literacy first would be a much more practical focus and then coming up to open education. And the other point, I know you said not to go into the detail, but I wonder if the card to do with, which is currently under open education, uh, that's labeled what is learning and how has it changed? Really, that seems to me that, that fits better under micro five. Yeah. Uh uh, Grania, both valid points. Um, I mean, my, my initial gut feel response is yes, I think having media literacy uh, before open education is a better sequencing. Uh, also recognizing, of course, that a learner may decide to follow their own sequence. 
but uh, if we can present these in a sort of a recommended sequence, it might be more valuable to the learners. I think that is a, a valid point, and I, I certainly concur with that. Uh, Jim, uh, your, your thoughts on shifting uh, media literacy before open education? Yeah, I think uh, we had a brief chat playing about um, the need for a little bit of redundancy across the courses. And I think we've got to introduce the idea of open education, open resources in Micro One as well, because that's what they're dealing with. Um, so to alert people to the directory of open access journals, other resources and so on. But I'm happy with a more detailed look and uh, I support the idea that we get students practicing the skills and media literacy would lend itself in a following on from the introduction so i'm happy with that and uh, if you open up the card on what it's learning and how has it changed i think i also suggested that that um uh, i did make a comment on that would seem to have disappeared and anyway. maybe it was just about moving it but i agree with the uh the comment that it it seems to be um, a bit of a challenge for our key target audience, um, even though it's an important topic. So I would be happy with that to be moved uh, to Micro 5 and then we can reassess it in terms of Steve's outline and TESU's focus. Thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks for that, Jim. So let's uh, use our agile development approach and move it across temporarily um, and so we'll have that there we can always move it again uh, Stephen uh, how does that fit with what what you would want to cover in micro five um, to be honest going back to my earlier comment I, I don't know that this is necessarily a topic that feels like it fits with the rest of this course um, to me, it seems like something that could probably be tackled in another course um, that was more about uh, pedagogy and, and the history of education. Uh, I, I, I don't know how well it would jive with, with Micro 5 unless maybe we modified it in some way. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, Stephen, now that you've uh, expanded a bit more on that, you are convincing me as well. I mean, th this was one of the crowdsource topics that was suggested. Um, uh, we can uh, consider a proposal to, to remove it. I mean, we don't have to teach it. Gronje, um, I, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I mean, I, I take on board your points, absolutely. But I think we do need to say something, give an indication to students about I don't think we need to go into massive detail about the history of learning and pedagogy and stuff like that, but something kind of relatively simplistic about what is learning, what are the components of learning, um, what are the successful strategies uh, for successful learning, that kind of thing would be useful. So I think we can kind of tone it down, but I do think we need to give them an indication of what they're looking at because then that relates to the whole topic of how digital ellipses can be used to, um, to yeah i i think in the <clears throat> in the the wiki space for for micro three i tried to i tried to make that clear um in the the cards here we have what is independent self-directed learning and then introduction to independent self-directed learning and that seems kind of redundant. So in the second one of those, I focused more on what does, uh, what do learning outcomes look like? You know, what does, uh, and we have the, the self-assessment and the peer assessment plan. So yeah, kind of these, exactly what you're saying, what does, what are some learning strategies? What does, you know, effective learning and assessment look like? Um, I've got another quick comment. It also goes back to the first card uh, in the in the board uh, where the, the framework uh, link to lead I don't know if you can open that way uh, within the card I put in the URL um, and this sort of frames the, the bigger picture in a, a simple way for um, 
that's framework of frameworks. Maybe that's um, the link I put in was a table which had top level terms, framing ideas on the left. And then it had the comp component competencies, but it, it moved on quickly into practices um, and what competent learners do. And then it extended that to digital practices. practices uh, and that there's a, a generic single framework that's quite a neat focus for what we want to include. And I think it would be useful to get students to reflect on on that and where they are. Or, you know, there's some self-evaluation type focus when they start off, you know, how much experience they're confident. And that might be something to look at um, at that stage as well. But I, say, I think uh, my preference at this stage is not probably to get into too much detail <laughs> uh, because we'll take all morning or all evening, all night. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Jim. Um, and again, I, mean, I don't think we should get into too much detail on the individual cards. Uh, but nonetheless, it seems to me the consensus uh, opinion that is emerging is uh, re with regards to this card, the, the focus is really on you know, strategies for effective learning, uh, thinking about um, you know, learning strategies and how we use you know, digital technologies and the tools available for that purpose. And with that in mind, it's the, the con emerging consensus is it seems to me that that card is then better placed uh, you know, somewhere here in the introduction is sort of my, my gut feeling, uh, to, you know, taking in uh, St Stephen's comments uh, into account. So let me just quickly ask the question, is, is that a general feeling that's a good place to have it now? Of course, you can always move it later on. Uh, that seems to be kind of a, a consensus uh, sort of view at the moment. Yeah, I agree with that. As long as, uh, as Steve hinted, we don't start you know, delving into pedagogy and the history of education. Um, I think I now know where that framework is, Wayne, is in the first card, in my comment on that card. I, yeah, um, I'm not, Jim, I'm, I'm sure you, it, I think it's just a question of remember, uh, of finding out where we posted that link. I'm, I, uh, immediately yeah. I can't see it. But if not, I've, I've made a note here just to follow up with you to get that link if we don't find it. Okay. But I, I think, again, the, the common emphasis is on, you know, what learners are doing, or, you know, in this space. Yeah. And how that's yeah. changed. And it, it comes back to their academic practice and study skills and where they are starting from, you know, what's the starting point. So I think it is important to keep it you know, on the board. Yeah, no, agreed. Well, I'm glad that the history of education is not going to make it, but um, you know, shouldn't we consider you know, the, the most appropriate parad paradigmatic point of departure for, for learning? <laughs> you know, it upset a couple of constructivists and behaviorists and you know, that crowd. <laughs> I see, yeah, no, no comment, no comment. Moving on, moving on, moving on. Okay, uh, so just getting back to the original question, uh, are, are we comfortable with the sort of the high level micro course division taking into account that uh, the recommendation is to shift media literacy before the detail of open education, uh, but also taking into account uh, the needs of, of, of Stephen's particular course you know, there would be flexibility for, for, for Stephen to, you know, determine the sequence, uh, you know, for, for his particular t uh, target audience. Um, so that's the proposal on the table. I just want to uh, hear if you are comfortable with that. Silence, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Okay, so let, let's move forward with that decision. Um, within, with any sort of open design and development, as we start unpacking the learning outcomes of each of these individuals, uh, you know, we can get to see, oh, okay, maybe it is better if we place this thing before that thing. So, um, you know, that's part of the dynamic iterative process of design. So we'll still be able to do that. 
but uh, I'm, I'm glad we've been able to move forward uh, with sort of the high level uh, decisions on the individual micro courses. Um, of course, we could, if we wanted to now, is actually go and unpack each individual card, uh, but I, I actually don't think that's uh, a very productive thing to be doing now. Uh, I think what would be uh, a, a more appropriate approach would be to, uh, for Grania, myself, and anybody else in, in the group who wants to work on articulating the learning outcomes, uh, that we uh, go and work on those learning outcomes. I can give you an example of the format that we had in mind. Uh, let me just quickly go here. In a moment, I'll come back to these pages. So I'm going to just scroll quickly. If you get a bit lost now, don't worry. I just want to find the link. Uh, this was in the days when we, uh, before we changed the order. So what, what we are aiming to achieve in the next uh, sort of iteration of this outline is this uh, specification for each micro course. So it would have the section on you know, what we think the topics are, uh, the actual learning pathways, the nomenclature we use at the OERU is the individual learning sequences. We call them uh, learning pathways to avoid the, uh, the conflicts of you know, people calling their things modules, units, spaceships, uh, you know, study units, and whatever. We just use learning pathways. So we would have the learning outcomes of each of the learning pathways, possible suggested resources, um, because it's all based on open access resources. Um, and we like to incorporate uh, learning challenges in the OERU language. We, we, we use the, the concept of learning challenges, but for those of you familiar with sort of e-learning e design and Jilly Salmon's work around e-activities, we have a hybridized uh, implementation of uh, Jill, uh, Jill's work on activities and it actually works very well in this environment. So that's just tying up the language there. Uh, and then we also, these are just the individual learning pathways, and we also then um, you've got a couple of proposals around how the learning might be assessed for uh, summative purposes. So that's the high-level framework uh, which we are using to propose the outline for each of these micro courses. And again, I, I would like to acknowledge uh, the framework that uh, that Thomas Edison State University have been using uh, for the PLA uh, PLA 300 course. You'll see Stephen is this this framework that I'm using to outline these individual micro courses is very similar to the framework that you guys are using. I you know I think it's a good way of uh, you know, taking this forward. Uh, to the next step. So that, just by way of introduction, that is what an outline will look like for the individual micro courses. What I'm proposing we do, uh, Grania, myself, and anybody else who wants to be engaged in this process, we will develop those uh, micro course outlines. Uh, Grania, I guess maybe over the next week or so, uh, you're kind of like a first draft of that. Uh, from a timing point of view, let me just check with you if that, that is a feasible timing. Um, and, and we will be doing that in the wiki. Anybody will be able to see and uh, comment and add and tweak. But I'm aiming to get to the point that we can, you know, have a curriculum outline within seven to ten working days. Uh, and, uh, and we will, of course, take any feedback uh, we receive. Uh, but I should also just add, it's a very open source uh, approach that we use. We work on a model of uh, uh, rough consensus and running code. Uh, what that means, you would have seen that in action here, we try and achieve a rough consensus and then we implement things and get things done. Uh, we don't go into 18 months of deliberation uh, around a, a particular point. Uh, if you aren't at the table to make a decision, you've got to uh, accept the decision that you know, the folk around the table are taking. And the people that are actually involved, actively involved are the folk that determine how this thing goes, goes forward. So if you do want to shape the future of this development, I strongly advise <laughs> that you be involved because uh, in 10 days time, there's gonna be an outline and we're going to implement it. So uh, at the risk of sounding like a benevolent dictator, uh, I just wanna uh, you know, open it to the floor and just make sure that we, we are comfortable with that approach. You know, rough consensus running code, and uh, uh, this is not a democracy. Uh, we, we don't work with 50% plus one. 
uh, if, if there are three people at the table, those are the people that are going to take the decision. So, just putting it out there. <laughs> Any objections to that approach? Do we have to vote on that? Uh, uh, silence means assent. <laughs> okay, moving on then, moving on, moving on. No, that, that, that's looking good. Uh, I mean, I think the process that we've been following up until uh, now is actually working quite well. I mean, we've, we've got to a point that we've got reasonable consensus of a high-level overview. Uh, and, yeah. Okay. Uh, right, we've done that. Uh, next item on the agenda, the, the next steps. Uh, one of the things we do with our open course developments um, is we we put together a, a, a rough design blueprint. Agronia, you'll be happy to know that our, our blueprints that we use in the open uh, design approach are considerably more succinct than you, you would ex expect to find a blueprint at the Open University, for example. It's just really a high level document. So these are the courses, th you know, this is the audience, this is what we're trying to achieve. And we move on. Ah, oh, great. Gronia likes that. I, uh, we, we've chosen our consultant well. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, the purpose of this document is, is really anybody that's coming in from the open community that's wanting to get involved with the design will be able to quickly see, oh, okay, this is what they're doing. This is what they're trying to achieve. But the real design work actually happens on, you know, with the development of the individual uh, sort of learning pathways. So that's all good. Um, right, so this is a, a procedural issue that we have to complete here because a target polytechnic will be uh, awarding academic credit. We have to complete the program approval documents uh, for this course outline uh, for the meeting of the 18th of July of academic board. Um, and the closing of the agenda is the 1st of July. So um, we are aiming to have the first draft of this uh, you know, outline of the micros completed, say within the next seven to 10 working days. There'll be a period for any, you know, folk to comment, tweak, refine, but we're gonna be putting those documents forward uh, on the 1st of July for approval towards the graduate diploma in tertiary education so that we can get the cre uh, credits uh, certified here at Otago Polytechnical Transcript Credit. Right. Again, uh, this is just a point about uh, parallel development. I mean, this is an open environment. So, I mean, the individual courses can be developing in parallel with each other. That's fine. The other uh, step that uh, folks sitting around the table might want to consider, if you are intending to uh, award credit at your own institutions or want to initiate processes locally for approval, you kind of need to be, you know, having your say now, uh, if, you know, if there's a key aspect of a course that needs to be included in order for you guys to, you know, get this approved for local credit at your own institution, and now is actually a good time to get that in. Uh, so I just want to alert you to that uh, this process is moving forward. Uh, and uh, we're aiming to have this the full course completed uh, by 30th of September. So uh, the, the one step that I'm missing there, uh, which we'll need to add, and I'll minute this, is, uh, is the drafting of the uh, outlines of the individual micro courses. So I'll just add that in there. So just quickly going around the table, uh, are you comfortable with those next steps? Do they make sense? Am I missing anything? Just a brief comment, Wayne. I know we talked within OERU about having some generic tutorials uh, available about the tools that are being used. And I know we intend to embed them in this course. And I think it would be useful at some stage if you could just alert, um, you know, make a list, uh, accessible list of the, the tool tutorials that exist, because I know some of them have been run before. Uh, by OERF. 
Yeah, uh, Jim, that's a very, very good point, and I, I'm glad you uh, you know, have brought that up. Uh, so, so Grania, one of the things that uh, I mean, you would have seen how we run our courses. We encourage learners to maintain their own, you know, own personal course blogs uh, rather than you know centralized e-portfolio systems. Uh, we use micro blogging. Uh, we have another tool which is proving to be quite productive. Um, a, a resource bank where uh, where learners share open resources that they find. And so we've got a couple of tools that we use specifically in the OERU. And we kind of want to integrate those skills into the learning sequence so that if a learner has completed, say, the first micro course uh, of, of LEADER, they will be well equipped to use the, the technologies and social media tools that we actually use for the delivery of OERU courses. So that apart from having the option of learners getting formal credit for you know, the, these skills, that we would be able to use them as resources in any one of the OERU courses, if you know if that makes sense. So, I, I and mean, that's an important facet of what we're doing. And so, we'll have to make sure that in micro course one, that we design it in such a way that we integrate those tools in, in, into the learning, uh, uh, or into the learning. The other tool, which is quite significant in our particular context, is uh, the forums tool. We don't use a, a traditional. Uh, discussion forum engine that uh, that you would typically find because we don't have tutorial support uh, we've got issues around how you uh, manage spam and those sorts of things and we actually use a technology called discourse it's an open source platform that actually has uh, a number of features built into it uh, you actually build your trust levels within the community uh, and as your trust levels increase and improve, more features of the software are, are made available to you. So it's a kind of this sort of thing that, uh, you know, if you're reading posts and contributing likes and, uh, you know, you're generally being a good citizen, you would get more features of the software open to you. For example, being able to recategorize a post that the learners have inadvertently categorized, you will get privileges to be, actually delete spam posts. So it actually becomes a self-managing community. Um, so I just wanted to make that point uh, about the integration of the tools. Ronnie, it, does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I know it's like, um, <clears throat> I can't remember what the tool called, Stack something. I, I, I think it's an excellent um, idea yeah. to have a tool like that. It gives much more flexibility, uh, learner control. So, And I also agree, agree with Jim's point about um, uh, giving them links to how they can use the various tools. That's great. Fantastic. Right. Getting back to the agenda then. Um, I take it that there are no additional comments relating sort of to the curriculum outline and the next steps we are at at the moment. I'll just check. Silence is a good thing. Great. Okay, just then uh, moving on, I just wanted to quickly briefly uh, link to the, the tools that we actually use for course development in the OERU. I do apologize to those that are very familiar with our tool set, um, but just for those who are new to the, uh, the OERU course development model, we have a number of uh, tools which we use to facilitate the development. Uh, every course that we develop has a, a, a a planning homepage, um, and that is the page where everything about the course development is linked. So you'll see at the moment I, I have the work in progress template because we haven't finalized a number of components of the main planning page, but it includes things like you know the design team. If you want to be part of this development and the design team, you need to list your name there uh, so that we know. We have a high-level Gantt chart, and we don't uh, go overboard with uh, this level of project management because any of you that have used this methodology knows that you can very quickly, in environments that have many interdependencies, spend more time keeping the Gantt chart up to date than actually doing actual work. So the way that we use it in the OERU is just really very, very high level. Um, you know, micro one, we're planning to finish at this date, that date, and. Uh, the next date, and this helps us at the OERU. We currently have about 17 live developments at the moment, so it's it's useful to have sort of these high-level uh, uh, Gantt charts of where we're at. 
Grania, I, I'll have a chat with you offline in terms of how we do this, but you'll see that there's a table here uh, and we, we just uh, amend these dates. It's pretty straightforward and it will then, you know, populate the, uh, the graphic of, of the Gantt chart. So these, these dates aren't accurate at all. I, I just uh, put this in as a boilerplate. Uh, we will put in the correct names here now that we're getting a better idea of what they are. And then between us, we work on those dates, Grania, to fit your schedule. Uh, as long as we finish everything by the 30th of September, I'm happy. And I don't, uh, you know, if we do a lot up front or we spread it evenly, it's fine by me. However, we want to work on that. Um, you know, any you know, key planning documents that form part of this development, one of which is the design blueprint. So once we've actually completed the curriculum outlines for each of these individual courses, we will be able to populate that blueprint and then move forward with the development. Here, I, uh, you know, just you know, links that uh, we, we believe are, are you know, useful and valuable around you know, other resources uh, to help form our thinking. We just add those there. I know Sarah Lambert has already uh, recommended a couple of links from you know, some open courses that are available at the OU, which seem to be like a good fit. I'll add those there. Uh, here are the links to the course specifications for each of those micro courses. This is the stuff that Grania and I are going to be working on over the next couple of, uh, next couple of days. And of course, uh, there's a public record of all our meetings. Uh, and uh, here is the uh, place we will actually start linking to the actual uh, course materials in the wiki. We have uh, technology where we are able to produce snapshots for WordPress websites uh, using a collection of wiki pages. And that's the way we develop courses at the OERU. And that gives us the flexibility for reuse of, of this content in, in, in you know, different delivery technologies. So that's the main uh, planning page. Uh, Grania, I'll have an offline chat with you about transclusion. That's a very technical thing, but it's very powerful and gives us the ability to uh, you know, manage certain links just in one place that will propagate through the whole course. But I'll have that conversation with you offline. Uh, so that's the main planning page. The other tools which are, are very important is the, the group list. Uh, I think many of you... Are, have already signed up for the group list. We have an open source technology uh, which is hosted here at groups.oeru.org. It's an email list uh, which also has a web interface so we keep a transparent record of all the conversations uh, that are happening around this course development. So if you do want to post a question or you know contribute something uh, you need to sign up and register for this list. Uh, and then you'll receive those email communications. Uh, the practice uh, in any open course development at the OERU is if your comment isn't posted on a talk page in the wiki, you'll see that every uh, wiki has a discussion page. We use that typically if, if you're commenting on a specific page in the course development, you know, you're wanting to have a bit of a discussion saying, oh, I think the sequencing of this thing should be that or whatever, or I want to include that. We use the wiki talk pages for that purpose. For the more general discussions within the group, we use their group list. Uh, I mean, you'll appreciate the OERU is distributed across, you know, with 30 plus institutions from five different continents. We don't have a single mail server. So the way that we communicate across the institutions is using this technology. But what I wanted to reference was if your comments or contributions don't exist in either the wiki or this group list, they don't exist as far as the OERU is concerned. So, you know, sending me personal emails or your buddy a personal email about, you know, how this open course is developing uh, has no impact on the open course development. So um, just, if, you need, if you need to give inputs, that, that these inputs need to be public and they need to be transparent so that everybody can see what's happening. So that's a little bit about the open design and the tools we're using. And the last uh, link I want to link to is we use a, a Kanban board uh, for the actual uh, design and development of the key tasks and activities that we need to complete. We uh, have you know, different columns, you know, the things that we need to do, things we are doing, things that are almost done, and the things that we've finished. And as we are working, we will populate these cards. So for example, I need to now add a card uh, about, 
oh, no, I've done that already, You're developing the course outlines. So, you know, we're going to start doing that. So you get the idea as we are doing things. Uh, you know, we add the cards. You are able to comment on any card. Cards can be moved around. Um, and, and this helps us manage the project at the micro level and is a much more effective way of dealing with the interdependencies. Anybody can come in and see where we are at. Um, we, you know, tag these cards according to, you know, is it a planning activity? Is it development? If it's something that's urgent, we, you know, you can add an urgent tag. You know, you go into the card. You add the urgent tag, uh, or you can remove a tag. That's pretty straightforward, and so that just helps with the project management. You can come in and say, "Oh, okay, what are all the urgent things that need to be done?" And we can immediately see, uh, you know, what needs to be done. But what you need to do is, uh, I will send out an, e an email uh, with the link where you need to register. You need to register an individual account on each of these technologies. At this point in time, we don't have single sign-on for the different development tools we're using. And the reason for that is we, before we actually go and spend all the effort on single sign-on for every tool, uh, is we have a good look to see you know, what are the tools that our developers and designers are using, what are the tools and technologies that stick before we go on to the single sign-on uh, solutions. So I just want to apologize for the fact that at this stage, you have to actually create individual accounts on each of these technologies. But that's just how it is at the moment. Um, but you, you will need to uh, register an account on this Kanban board if you want to post uh, or comment on any of the cards. Uh, it is a public board. You won't need an account to actually see the Kanban board. But in order to contribute, obviously, it's a spam protection measure. You actually have to have a registered account. So those are the technologies we are using. And at this point, if there are no additional agenda items or comments, we can start wrapping up and adjourning. Wayne, I just have a, one quick question. Sure. Um, I created a Kanban account, but I don't seem to be able to edit anything on the board. Is uh, there... can, can you remember what your username was? It's S. Phillips. Problem solved. Okay. Yeah, you should be able to uh, comment now. And you, uh, it will be nice if you put, you know, put a nice picture of yourself there. Uh, it just makes it easier when we're looking at the cards, you know, just sort of the gestalt and say, oh, okay, great comments coming from the US. <laughs> sure. Thanks. No worries. Thanks, uh, Stephen. Any other uh, questions, comments? Fantastic. Silence is a good thing. <laughs> right, folks, I, I really appreci appreciate your time, uh, especially those that got up uh, at the crack of dawn. And uh, Gronya, I know it's getting very late for you, but I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, you giving, uh, you're all giving up the time at these awkward hours that we could at least have this launch session together uh, and, you know, get ourselves on the same page, uh, so to speak, both figuratively and literally, because we're working off one wiki page. So that's great. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye for now. Goodbye, all. Um, just you. a closing comment is I'll post the um, a, a, a summary of the meeting in the wiki. I'll circulate that. If you don't agree with what with my summary, make it better. It is a wiki, uh, but if it's uh, totally inaccurate, I will revert back to the recording. So, <laughs> thanks everyone. Take care. Bye.